Next up, we have another local, um, Austin Beigel. First saw an image of what abortion looked like in 2013 and has been involved in the anti in anti-abortion activism ever since. He worked full time in the pro-life in pro-life ministry for years until he became an, an abortion abolitionist after seeing the corrupt inner workings behind the Ohio heartbeat bill. He now is the president of end and abortion Ohio and lobbies for equal protection under the law for our pre-born neighbors in, in this state. He is also running as a candidate for house district 73 in Ohio in the, in Ohio house of representatives. He lives with his wife, Maria and their three children in Pinkerton. Let's welcome Austin. Hello, I'm Austin Beigel, president of End Abortion Ohio. We are an abolitionist organization that seeks equal protection for the preborn in Ohio. We've been doing this work for over a year now. Uh, really got started in uh, about October last year, um, looking to push this uh, issue of abolition in our state, in our state legislature uh, that had not been pursuing this, that had been pursuing many other things, uh, pain-capable acts, heartbeat bills, maybe a Life at Conception Act with all these various exceptions. And we said, no, we need personhood. We need equal protection. No one in the state is really pushing that to our state legislators. So we're going to do it. We found Christians around the state, Christians who had uh, experience even in the pro-life movement before, who had come to believe these uh, abolitionist ideas uh, even recently. And we, we banded together with a group of Christians around the state with this objective to abolish abortion in Ohio. So we recently just had uh, our first rally for equal protection at the Ohio State House, where we had uh, over 100 people come out there and uh, had a great lineup of speakers. Those videos are online on the, the End Abortion Now YouTube channel. You can listen to, to those that, that just happened recently. And so we, we've grown a lot in the impact we've been able to have in the last year uh, has been nice, but it's not enough. We still don't have equal protection there until the, the work is done. We will continue to labor on. So what we've primarily been doing is dealing with these words right here. This is the Abolition of Abortion in Ohio Act. Just, just a portion of it. But this bill is only two pages long. If you've never read a piece of legislation in your life, this is a great one to start with because any uh, fifth grader can understand what's in here. It's very, very simple. It's uh, something we can take right into the legislator's office and show them. They can read it. We can sit down and read it with them in a minute or two minutes, and it makes sense to them. They, they at least understand what the words mean. Sometimes they have moral disagreements with what's in it. Uh, it. It shocks them to hear something so different from an anti-abortion organization. They're, they're very used to getting uh, easy efforts that are supported by a lot of other big groups, a lot of other big pro-life groups. And the ask we're doing right here is to say, no, don't work with all those other groups on their heartbeat bill. Do something that would actually abolish abortion. Um, and so we've been pushing this and uh, we found a, a state representative to, who said he would introduce it in the Ohio House of Representatives, and he ended up not doing it. And why did that happen? That's because all the other pro-life organizations got involved, and they found out about this, as Lizzie said, and they didn't want him to do it. I mean, they, they were calling him. They were sending the, the presidents of their organizations into his office. He was getting calls from the attorney general of other states in Kentucky. I mean, they, they swarmed him with an overwhelming effort not to introduce this bill into Ohio, the, the one that actually would save the babies uh, in Ohio and establish justice, which is also necessary. It wouldn't acquit the guilty. This is a just piece of legislation, and the, the pro-life movement viciously attacked this thing. So how did I get started in doing this? Well, um, there's, there's a, what started my transition right there, a shocking moment. That's a fist coming out the, the other side of my face there. Uh, I have been doing a lot of work with Created Equal, one of the organizations Russell talked about earlier. And so I had been doing anti-abortion ministry and activism for a long time. And some of the, the ideas of the pro-life movement weren't really sitting well with me. You know, what, when I heard people debating like, OK, we have a, a heartbeat bill here and a life at conception act. And I, the legislators would look at them both and they'd go, eh, we'll do the heartbeat bill instead. Th that was like my, my one of the first signals was like that. That's weird. Like. 
Ohio has all Republicans in the Ohio House of Representatives, in the Ohio Senate. We, we have the executive branch, the judicial branch. Like Republicans controlled everything. The pro-life movement controlled everything with, with veto power, uh, even uh, against a, a governor. And so it was really weird to see them start to make those decisions, uh, even on the pro-life side of things, like the lesser bill. Um, and it was always like, uh, maybe we'll do the, the life of conception later, but not right now. Uh, as Lizzie said, it's, it was always that, not right now, uh, ad infinitum. And, and so me doing outreach for a long time uh, with Created Equal, uh, one day I just ended up getting punched in the face for doing what I had already done for many, many days. Uh, and somehow the new story blew up. And uh, I ended up on, on Fox and Friends in the morning with an audience of 20 million people. And they say Donald Trump watched this thing every morning. And there I was, uh, the face of the pro-life movement for a minute. And what did I do? Did, did I preach the gospel and say abortion is murder? No, I, I, I spoke pro-life talking points and I name dropped a few organizations and we had rehearsed what I was going to say. And I didn't say anything bad. I, I just didn't say anything uh, that was like the, the shocking truth. Uh, it was the standard pro-life message, the, the standard uh, you know, the, the left likes to use violence against us when you do X, Y, and Z to try and save babies. Uh, I could have gone on there and had a very bold message about Christ, um, but you get in the, this mindset in there, you know, we are the pro-life generation. Uh, we got to do this organization building and, and gain some momentum, get some name recognition with the legislators, and then maybe we can move that heartbeat bill to a Life of Conception Act, and then maybe we can start talking about doing something else. And, and you get caught up in it a little bit. And I had a, a pastor call me after I did this interview and he's like, Hey, I, I don't mean to, you know, criticize you too harshly here, but like, you, you were just on Fox news and I wish you would have talked about Jesus. And it really stuck with me. And I was like, man, why didn't I, <laughs> I, I used really generic platitudes and said all the right talking points. I was like, I, I had a huge audience there. Uh, and I really regretted it. And to this day, it remains uh, a huge regret. And, and I didn't just go on Fox News. I was on Prager and every other conservative talk show you can imagine. Uh, and through all these things, I, I had also spent time working at the Ohio Republican Party on big statewide campaigns. Some of these campaigns were paying a lot of money. I graduated here, Ohio State, with a political science degree. I kind of had the dream path. They were, they were giving me good job offers. I was getting interviewed to be the press secretary for the Ohio Speaker of the House who was Larry Householder at the time, so I'm really glad that didn't work out. He's in federal prison, if you don't know. Um, so God spared me from that one. But, you know, I, I kind of had, like, the layup to, to the perfect, like, uh, political opening, kind of what every conservative American-loving college student dreams of. I was uh, getting invited to private dinners where Mike DeWine would come in, but, uh, Mike Pence would come in even, uh, these are $20,000 tables. They're just giving us free tickets and stuff. And th that, that's kind of the pro-life movement. And, and what I have learned since then is they buy you off with access. Like they make you feel important as long as you don't uh, upset the status quo. As soon as you start saying the really challenging stuff, like oh, you, you don't get your table anymore. Uh, and that doesn't feel so great when you're, when you're like on the upper trajectory. So it's really easy to get caught up in that pro-life movement. Um, something really shook my world though. Uh, I heard Scott Klusendorf say something, uh, one time when we were at a, uh, what time, I don't even know what his group is called, whatever they are in Indiana, uh, life defenders. Yeah. Thank you. I went to a life defenders class and talked to Scott Klusendorf, who was on the screen earlier. Russell talked about him. And so I was kind of asking him like, Hey, is it, is it unloving when we say we're going to do, uh, a 15 week ban instead of a heartbeat bill? Like, why are we? not going for, for the better ones. And he was like, well, you know, th this whole ending abortion kind of thing, it's going to take a really long time, maybe like over a hundred years. So we just need to take what we can get for now and save some babies along the way. And hearing that it was going to take a hundred years or more was like really off-putting. And it, it didn't make sense to me, especially what I have was reading in my Bible where that, like when, when people move to establish justice quickly and put God first. It, it doesn't really happen like that. It, 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 uh, God works in, in, in the faith of men uh, and not the compromise of men. And so 
seeing seeing some of those decisions that were being made, it was like making me question, like, are, are we actually using the Bible as our reasoning for why we just picked a heartbeat bill over a Life of Conception Act? Or am I just looking at the world and and kind of listening to what people are saying is possible right now? And the people who are saying what's possible uh, are the ones who don't want abolition at all. And, and so they're, they're beginning that lie uh, to start with and getting a lot of people to buy a note. We can't do this. The governor won't do it. X, Y, Z. So, of course, I, I've heard of these abolitionists before. Uh, I was always told to think of them very negatively. They're super divisive. Um, they're kind of destroying the pro-life movement. All they do is criticize people for uh, silly, stupid reasons, and we, we can't associate with them whatsoever. I, I was actually told, I quote, they are the enemies. Uh, and so Russell was name dropped there. Like I, I thought Russell was my enemy for many, many years. Um, and I mean, I'm talking nearly a decade of being in the pro-life movement here in this stuff. And Eventually, I start just looking into it more, and as I worked on the heartbeat bill in 2019 and heard their deliberations on why they chose that instead of the Life at Conception Act, um, they had talked about personhood language before, but just weren't going to move on. It, it just made no sense. It, you had all Republicans in there. Uh, Ohio Right to Life was had opposed even the, the heartbeat bill. They were just running cover stories for a governor who wasn't even pro-life, and it was just it was weird. It's like, why... Why is that a, the biggest pro-life organization in the state running like a PR firm for a not pro-life governor? It, all sorts of money was getting swapped around and it, it started feeling gross. I left working in the Republican Party for that same reason. And I started getting those same doubts about the inner workings of these pro-life organizations I was seeing. Going to the March for Life eight years in a row, uh, seeing the leaders, hearing the conversations internally that went on. Uh, about the leaders at the March for Life, and then you go to the March for Life, and you know everyone's sucking up to each other and, and acting like we're best buddies and trading political favors. It it just started to get really gross, and it was gnawing at my conscience over and over and over. And so I had worked with James Silverman wherever he is for a few weeks uh, before he he left uh, at Created Equal, and uh, he had called me and he was just like, "Look, man." Uh, yeah, I know you, you said you're sympathetic to some of this abolitionist stuff before. Like, what do you think about coming to Oklahoma, just hearing what it's all about? And it, it, he called me like right after I was coming back from uh, the March for Life, where I just saw some of the most disgusting political movement and corruption in there and people keeping abortion legal for just really, really sinful reasons, to be frank. And so, you know, I, I was like, yeah. Maybe I do need to look at something else. Maybe I will give that abolitionist ideology a, a chance here. And so I started having conversations uh, internally at the organization I was working for. And I was told, do not go. You cannot even associate with these people. Don't let their words go in your ears. If you go there, like this is going to be like a fireable offense. These people are our enemies. Uh, like, do not go. I forbid you. Uh, and we, me and my wife had just had our first baby at that point. Uh, it, it was, it was a, a pretty stressful decision to make, but I, I knew I had prayed about it and that gnawing in my conscience just was not going to go away. I knew I had been suppressing it for a long time. Uh, and, and I just knew it wasn't going to go away. I, I was a Christian. When, when you get that feeling about something in your life that, you know, uh, you need to change. That was it. <laughs> it was, it was the Holy spirit. You can't dodge him for long. Uh, and so I just said, you know what, whatever the consequences may be, I'm going to go just listen to, to what this is. And so I drove from Columbus down to Oklahoma, good old 15 hour drive. Uh, and I listened to Russell talk for a few days and a number of other abolitionists get up there. And it was so biblical and Christian focused. I'm, you heard that first presentation. I mean, you, you get days of that. And, you know, I, I was working for an organization that had a lot of Christian beliefs. And, you know, we went on campus and we did preach the gospel, um, but we didn't do it in all things. There were, there were certain times where we didn't do it, especially in the legislative side of things. Uh, we didn't really use the gospel as our guidance there, as our instruction manual there, as our ultimate authority there. And so just hearing from, from those uh, abolitionist speakers, I uh, kind of solidified what had been gnawing in my conscience for a while. I went back up there and I was immediately fired. I mean, I drove right back up to Ohio. Uh, on my way back, I got a text that said, don't come into the office. Uh, meet me at a Waffle House. And I got fired in a Waffle House. That's a fun story. But 
Um, you, you know, you, you reach this point where I realized it was impossible to be neutral on this position. There, there really are two sides and you have to pick. Uh, you can't sit in the middle on it. Um, there's consequences uh, when, when you when you do change here. Uh, but ultimately, if you want to follow Christ and, and honor him as Lord, uh, you know, when you have that Holy Spirit, uh, you know, telling you something to sin, you know, run away from it, run away from that sin. Uh, so I say, why am I an abolitionist now? It's because I don't have a choice. I'm a Christian. Like, that's it. I, 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 I was talking to a pro-life guy recently and he was like, hey, can like you've been criticizing pro-life organizations a lot. It's not very helpful against issue one. Can you like maybe just wait a little bit until after the vote to do that? I was like, no, I, I can't stop preaching the gospel. I can't stop calling out evil, exposing uh, darkness and all these things. Like I'm, I told him I'm enslaved to this doctrine the same way I'm enslaved to Christ because my beliefs come from the word of God. Uh, the abolitionist thought is scripture derivative and uh, I, I can't stop doing this for a while. I can't put it on pause. That's like putting uh, my servitude to Christ on pause. It's just, it, it's my identity now. Uh, I'm going to do it and, and trust God that, you know, no matter what happens in this, this election, uh, it, God has a plan for it. And, and we often see that through evil, uh, God works out good things to happen in the future. And so whatever the fate is for Ohio, whether it's, you know, God's wrath or God's mercy upon us, uh, we're just called to trust him and, and keep uh, preaching the truth, not not change our message based on the political winds and what looks possible. And and what what is possible is really what the pro-life organizations uh, say is possible. Uh, like I, I've been asking people, what do you think would happen if the, the organizations that Russell had on the screen, what if all of them just said, our, our standard position is we will never endorse a candidate. We will never fund a candidate who doesn't believe in full personhood uh, for all human beings, human beings in the womb. I mean, you'd get that abolition bill uh, through very easily. Like the politicians, uh, they, they parrot whatever the, the pro-life organizations say. A lot of them um, really don't even care about the pro-life issue that much. They just like the money that comes in through it. Uh, and this is me after having... 50 plus lobbying meetings with our state legislature in Ohio. That, that's the most common thing is, you know, they, they really don't care that much. They, they just, it's the Republican thing to do. So I'll say as much as the pro-life movement needs me to say, uh, we've actually heard someone, you know, we said like, what are your thoughts about abortion? And the representative said, what do they need to be? <laughs> he, he thought we were going to be the, the normal old pro-life organization coming in there telling them, well, we just want you to put this thing on your Twitter. We want you to vote no on this pro-abortion thing and you'll be good to go and then we'll fund you your re-election campaign that that's not how we operate at end abortion ohio uh, we're not there to be friends with our state legislature we're there to hold them accountable and push them and make them feel very very uncomfortable and lose all of our access to being invited to protect women in ohio which we were invited to initially and i, I said I, I don't think you want me in there not, i'll get kicked out of the first meeting um but that's why i'm an abolitionist is it, it's biblical I, I don't have a choice not to be I don't have a choice just to show partiality to my uh, pre-born neighbors just because I want to see maybe some lives saved right now. I, I don't have the authority to sin to see people's lives be saved. You know, I, I would been asked by a bunch of different pro-life employees, uh, all these different analogies on why this happened to me and why I chose to do th this thing and that thing. Um, and some of the analogies are like, well, like, would you do X sin if someone had a, a gun to your family's head? I was like, no, <laughs> that's really, I, I thought that was a, an easy question to answer. Like, that's what it means to be a Christian is like, to live as Christ, to die as gain. This is what it means to, to take up your cross and follow Christ. Uh, that's why I'm an abolitionist. So if you want to hear more of my full story, I, I did a, a podcast uh, with Abolitionist Rising um, over a year ago, uh, talking about the, the full story and, and everything that happened there. I did leave the pro-life movement ultimately, uh, and, and some of those distinctions that were made. Uh, now I am running for state representative uh, in the Ohio House of Representatives. I have seen, uh, I was there in Louisiana when I, that pro-life letter came out. And saw my face up in there in the, the bleachers in, the, in that picture. Uh, th that, what I saw happen there was, uh, was I, I've been outside of a lot, a lot of abortion clinics and seen a lot of babies go in there and not come out. But what I saw in Louisiana, when the pro-life organizations killed that bill, it was like 
the biggest wave of evil I had ever experienced. Like it, it rocked me to my core. Uh, and this is after I had already been fired by the pro-life movement, but it, it really lit a fire in me that said, I have to do everything possible to change the status quo, to remove the political power from these pro-life organizations that are keeping abortion legal, um, destroying abolition bills, uh, and in doing so, allowing babies created in the image of God to be destroyed. And so I'm, I'm using my uh, political experience to run for office right now. I'm doing so as an abolitionist. I say it clearly on my website. I am an abortion abolitionist. I'm trying to make that distinction because the distinction is very real and, and the labels matter and the words matter. Um, it, an abolitionist describes what, what I am and I am a Christian. And so that's my story. Uh, I'd love to talk to you about it more. Uh, if, you, if you want, you can go to my website and see everything else I believe in. You can see if you still like me after that. Uh, but thank you for your time here.